Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight to celebrate the art of filmmaking. I'm Jim Glazer, the Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences at Tufts University. Tonight, you will hear from professors, students, alumni, and friends, all of whom have a love of film and are dedicated to the creative arts. This event is special, as you will have a rare glimpse into the beginning stages of how a movie is made. Special thanks to screenwriters Adam Wilson, class of 2004, and Justin Taylor for sharing a preview of their script, The Last Days of Basic Cable. And thank you to Max Winkler, the director. Tough students will play tonight's roles. Thank you to Blake, Charlotte, Ethan, Alexandra, and Iomide. We are grateful to Professor and Chair of the Department of Theater, Dance, and Performance Studies, Noe Montez, for his work casting these roles and for his dedication in bringing the script to life. Finally, we are especially thankful to Albert Berger, Class of 1979, and Ron Yerksa, the co-founders of Bonafide Productions, for allowing us to see their creative process. Tonight, you will hear from Professor Tasha Oren, Director of the Film and Media Studies Program, one of Tufts' most vibrant interdisciplinary programs. Utilizing new space in Barnum Hall, Film and Media Studies has grown in student majors each year and has tremendous potential for synergy among different areas at Tufts, including Performance Studies and the School of the Museum of Fine Arts. Professor Oren will also talk to you about the C.J. Saracino Internship Fund, which provides financial support for a tough student to spend their summer interning at Bonafide Productions. These internships provide an intimate firsthand look at Hollywood with some of the best in the business. Each summer, the team at Bonafide has helped make our students feel like they belong at the table inspiring the next generation of filmmakers in monumental ways. Thank you, Albert. Thank you, Ron, for allowing our students to learn from you. This fund and tonight's event is in memory of C.J. Saracino, a Tufts alumnus who sadly lost his life nine years ago. C.J. was a remarkable student, eager, confident, and vibrant, and one I remember fondly from my class. When CJ passed away, his friends and classmates in Los Angeles wanted to create a stronger connection to LA for students who had similar dreams of working in film as CJ did. Rosanna Shaw and Nancy Schrodes, two members of the class of 2011, along with CJ's roommate, William Waro, and a dedicated group of young alumni created this internship fund and have worked tirelessly to ensure its success. This fund, along with many of our financial aid resources, like the recent $25 million Schuler Access Initiative, which supports first-generation and Pell-eligible students, allows for the best and brightest to come to Tufts for transformational opportunities, regardless of their financial means. I hope that you enjoy our event this evening as always, it is inspiring to see the Tufts community coming together in such a meaningful and creative way. Thank you and enjoy the show. Thank you, Dean Glazer, and good evening, everybody. I'm Tasha Oren, Director of the Film and Media Studies Program, and it's really a thrill to be here with all of you to honor CJ Saracino and celebrate the collaborative art of filmmaking. Our partnership with the CJ Saracino internship has been at the heart of our program since its inception. Now, before FMS, there was CMS, which was a small communication and media studies minor, and it began in the late 90s. We became FMS, a major and a freestanding academic program in 2015. Three years ago, right before the pandemic hit, we moved from a snug little three room area on the second floor of the ex college building, for those of you familiar with, with Tufts, and moved to Barnum Hall, 
where we now have uh, dedicated classrooms, we have finishing labs, two studios, a renovated screening theater that see, uh, sits over 200. And we're currently updating our equipment uh, with new cameras and lighting kits to keep up with all the demand. We started in 2015 with six students and we are currently the largest humanities programs at Tufts with 140 majors and minors. So FMS is a liberal arts major and so we are deeply interdisciplinary. Uh, in addition to screenwriting and all aspects of production, we offer a wide array of classes in film and television theory and history and PR and cultural criticism and much, much more. And our fundamental aim is to train students who are multidimensional creators, critics, scholars, and uh, future media professionals. And a vital part of this vision and FMS's identity since it was launched has been the CJ Saracino internship. It's generous support in, colla in collaboration with Bonafide Productions allows our students an incomparable opportunity to spend the summer in LA working in a professional production company and being supported as they learn the ropes from the best. For, for many, I know this has been a defining, even a life-changing experience. And I am so grateful to have the opportunity to introduce Rosanna Shaw. She's the co-founder of the CJ Saracino Internship. Uh, Rosanna studied in communication and media studies with CJ. They both graduated Tufts in 2011. Today, she is an environment writer uh, for the LA Times and was recently named a Pulitzer Prize finalist. Rosanna and many people she worked with have been just extraordinary in their care and their engagement with the program. And she's here on behalf of the internship and many wonderful people who've welcomed our students and made this collaboration possible. Thank you, Rosanna. Thank you, Tasha. I am super grateful that tonight's event showcasing so many cool aspects of film is held in memory of CJ. I continue to be amazed by how much the film major has grown since I was at Tufts. I remember squeezing into that tiny second floor building very well. And back then all the film kids kind of gathered in that one corner of campus. And that's how I met CJ. He always had the biggest ideas and just so much energy and he did everything he could to make it out to LA. When he passed away, we wanted to do something that honored this journey to LA that he had worked so hard to figure out. A bunch of us, CJ's old roommates, our best friends in LA and New York, we got together and said, let's create the best internship Tuss has ever seen. And we really hit the jackpot with Albert and Ron at Bonafide Productions, who you will meet tonight and who have gone above and beyond as home base for this program. So every summer we now help one student come out here, intern with Bonafide, and we just try to make LA as welcoming as possible. Our first intern, Dylan, ended up living with CJ's old roommates for the summer. And Nancy Schroeds, another CMS alum, has helped out so many interns with health emergencies and just all the little things that make this big city feel less lonely. And having Albert and Ron mentor each intern has been the best. They put so much thought into it every year and their assistant Claire is wonderful and they have all just been so extremely thoughtful in their support and guidance. And just thank you, all of you for being here. For the past few years, I've really seen firsthand how much the Tufts film community can come together. There are no words to fully express how much everyone's support has helped me, helped CJ's family, and helped so many of our friends turn our grief into something so meaningful. We have a lot of our intern alums tuning in tonight, which I'm excited about, as well as CJ's family and the many, many people who have helped make this program possible. We have really built a community together and we're so proud to share this community with you tonight. I have a short video I'd love to share featuring one of our recent interns, Liz. I believe she's also tuning in today. So hi, Liz, and let's cue the video. Hi, my name is Liz Mailanie and I'm the 2019 CJ Saracino Scholarship Intern. What's great about Bonafide is Ron and Albert are so wonderful at 
really asking and listening. You feel like your opinion matters. We had the opportunity to uh, read scripts and give feedback and opinions. Ron and Albert are really wonderful about calling you in, reading what you've written, asking you questions about that. Being a part of Bonafide and having Ron and Albert take you to all of these spaces really normalizes the idea of Hollywood and it makes it feel a lot more approachable and it makes makes you feel like you belong and it's not this big scary thing. Just being in this space exposes you to so many other people in your industry or people who might not even be in your industry but who can act as supports for you in the future. I am so, so grateful and thankful to everyone who has contributed to making this possible and truly, truly hope that um, people continue to give as much as they can. I could have never dreamed for such an opportunity and I, I'm just, I'm going to be eternally grateful. It is really special what this internship is doing for people and I hope that it continues for years and years to come. So big shout out to CJ's old roommate, William Warrow for making that video. And I now have the honor of introducing Albert who will be introducing the rest of the incredible team behind the script you're about to see tonight. Albert formed Bonafide Productions with Ron Yerksa in 1992. Their producing credits include King of the Hill, Election, Cold Mountain, Little Children, and Best Picture Academy Award nominees, Little Miss Sunshine in Nebraska. I'm sure you've also seen some of their recent films, which include Juliet Naked, Peanut Butter Falcon, and The Last Shift. Ron and Albert were also co -exec Ron and Albert were also co-executive producers on the HBO series The Leftovers. Albert is a Tufts alum, and after he graduated, he went home to Chicago, where he owned and managed the Sandberg Theater, a revival showcase for obscure and classic fil films. He attended film school at Columbia University School of the Arts before moving to Los Angeles to write scripts and become the amazing producer that he is today. There is so much more I could say about Albert, but I'll end by saying that Albert is incredibly kind and generous. He has put so much heart into the CJ internship, and I've watched him thoughtfully guide so many students into various aspects of film. He really shows by example, what it means to be a good colleague in this industry. And it has really, has really meant a lot to me and everyone who has worked with Albert for the last decade. Albert, the floor is yours. Sorry about that, wow. Um, I was muted, but thank you very much, Rosanna. And thank you uh, for your commitment to your friend, CJ, um, the memory of CJ. Uh, it, it's been amazing working with you over this time. And Ron and I have had a great, great experience with uh, a whole variety of interns from Tufts, uh, from winterns to uh, regular interns, and most importantly, the Saraceno interns who are with us for the whole summer. And uh, we've really gotten a lot out of the whole uh, situation as well. Um, I think this uh, event is particularly meaningful uh, in memory of CJ because of uh, the um, connection back to Tufts. Uh, it, it seems only fitting that, uh, that, you know, in this era of Zooms that we're able to, um, to actually connect to students who will be acting tonight. Um, I will be hearing portions of the screenplay, The Last Days of Basic Cable. Uh, and to give you some context, the screenplay is set in the year 1999 at and around a Northeastern college campus. Um, it's in the, the, the main characters are students who have just graduated or about to graduate. Uh, it's a time of anxiety with technological change in the air, Y2K is looming. Um, uh, people are debating whether or not to use cell phones, uh, uh, what the implications of Napster are, and uh, whether to, to stick with basic cable or switch to premium cable. 
Uh, but most importantly, the students in this uh, screenplay are wrestling with ideas of what are they going to do next with their lives. Um, as a side note, we've used this script with a lot of our interns, particularly those from Tufts, to write coverage on. And uh, uh, just to give you uh, some additional context, right now we're in the process of casting the movie and we're hoping to go into production in the fall. And so without further ado, let me introduce my colleagues on this uh, film. First of all, there's my partner, Ron Yerksa, my producing partner. Uh, Ron and I have made uh, over 30 films together in about the last 30 years. Uh, he's an excellent producer, he's a great thinker, and he wrestles out of Santa Monica, California. Give a wave, Ron. There's Ron. Uh, also, we've got screenwriters, uh, Adam Wilson from the class of 04, Tufts. Um, he's a novelist, he's an essayist. Uh, his most recent novel was Sensation uh, Machines. Also, he wrote the novel Flat Screen and a collection of stories, What's Important is Feeling. Uh, these guys are very good with titles. But um, anyway, there's Adam residing from Brooklyn. I give a wave. Maybe you did. Uh, also, we've got Justin Taylor here, uh, just down from Portland and uh, over in my den in the other room. Uh, his most recent book is Riding with the Ghost which is a memoir about fathers and sons. Uh, he also wrote two short story collection, Flings being one of them, and Everything Here is the Best Thing Ever is the other short story collection, and also The Gospel of Anarchy, which is a novel. And Adam and, and Justin have both published uh, in, in many, many publications, both nonfiction and fiction. Uh, next up, we have our excellent director, Max Winkler. Uh, Max, has done a number of feature films, uh, Ceremony, Jungle Land, and Flower, to name a few. Uh, he's done tons of television, including American Horror Story, Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, and The Watcher, which is on Netflix, or coming up on Netflix. And uh, we're planning on The Last Days of Basic Cable being his crowning achievement to date. So uh, we'll be in production, as I said, in the fall, we hope. Uh, and then also we've got... Uh, a wonderful casting director, Justine Arteta, uh, her and her partner, Kim Davis Wagner, who can't be with us tonight, have cast many, many movies for Ron and I, including Little Miss Sunshine, Ruby Sparks, and Lowdown. Uh, Justine has also cast uh, the movie's adaptation, being John Malkovich with Kim, and uh, uh, they have an upcoming uh, TV series, or perhaps it's even on now, Daisy Jones and The Six for Amazon with Riley Keough. So there's Justine. And uh, basically that's our team. Uh, I, I wanna also give a huge shout out tonight to uh, Sarah Denlinger, who did an amazing job putting this event together. Thank you so much, Sarah. And, uh, and now it's my pleasure to introduce and hand it over uh, to Noe Montez, who's the Associate Professor and Chair of Theater, Dance and Performance Studies at Tufts. Noe um, has uh, published essays on a wide variety of topics, um, including very interestingly, uh, social activism in sports, which I wanna, uh, I wanna read your stuff on that. And he's directed and acted in plays all over the country and uh, particularly at Tufts as of late. And he's been a tremendous sport as far as uh, helping with this event and organizing the reading. And uh, I'll turn it over to Noe to introduce the actors tonight. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much for that, Albert. I am Noe Montez, Chair of the Department of Theater, Dance and Performance Studies at Tufts University. Uh, and I'm proud to introduce the uh, cast of this reading tonight, uh, many of whom have been active participants in the work of the department, whether they are majors, minors, or simply people with a love of theater and a love of working with the department. Uh, so without further delay, let me introduce the actors and they can give a wave as they're being introduced. Uh, Blake Bunny, who is playing the role of Ben, is a senior studying biochemistry. Uh, he's been in a number of department productions, including An Enemy of the People, Sense and Sense and Sensibility, and Spring Awakening, and he hopes that you enjoy the reading. Alexandra Averbach, who plays the role of Jessica, 
is a junior double majoring in theater and performance studies, as well as English. She's previously been in departmental productions of Sense and Sensibility, God of Carnage, and Spring Awakening, as well as Torn Ticket 2 productions of the 25th annual Putnam County Spelling Bee and Mamma Mia. Ethan Dunn, playing the role of Aaron, is a first year student, prospectively double majoring in biology and biotechnology with a minor in theater. Uh, as he notes in his bio, this is at least until he most likely changes his mind sometime next week. Uh, hailing from the Big Apple itself, he loves nothing more than spending time outside and watching movies with friends. Um, Charlotte McGee, who plays the role of Shauna, is a junior double majoring in clinical psychology and theater and performance studies. Uh, she's previously been in department productions of Enemy of the People, Sense and Sensibility, and The Government Inspector. Uh, finally, Ayomide Oloyede plays the role of Jason, and he's a first year at Tufts University with a love for performance. Last semester, he made his Tufts debut in the department musical Almanac. He's incredibly grateful for this opportunity. I will be reading the stage directions during this evening. So let me begin by introducing the last days of Basic Cable, written by Adam Wilson and Justin Taylor. Exterior, strip mall parking lot, afternoon. A sunny autumn afternoon. We see a strip mall off a highway somewhere in New England. Window displays are decorated for Halloween. Wind blows leaves and food trash across a mostly empty parking lot. Superimpose Halloween 1999. Superimpose the last days of basic cable. Aaron and Jason walk towards a store called Cell Phone Palace. Aaron, 22, is a lanky white guy with a Kurt Cobain haircut. He wears jeans, a t-shirt, and a Casio digital watch. He clutches a frayed copy of Anna Karenina. Jason, 22, is a handsome black guy. His clothes are similar to Aaron's, but they look better on Jason. He has a flat top fade haircut that's retro even for 99. He wears a Star of David on a chain around his neck. You're serious about this? Me in the world, man. But you've gone your whole life without one. I mean, times change. People will be able to find you. You realize that, right? They'll know where you are. I don't have to answer it. Interesting. I, I just feel like it's time. But if you get a cell phone, you'll be one of those guys who has, like, a cell phone. Dude, I'll just be me. But with a cell phone. At first, that might be true. One day, you're going to wake up and find yourself wearing a business suit, talking on your cell phone at a restaurant while people scowl at you. You're ruining their lunch. Interior, cell phone palace, continuous. A small store, fairly empty. Jason and Aaron enter. You know, what business am I in? You know, where is this restaurant? I, I could really use a good lunch. You're missing the point. Cell phones aren't just for anybody. You know who I bet has a cell phone? That asshole Ben. He definitely has one. Who? You know, that guy from our fiction workshop junior year? Oh, right. You know, I wonder what happened to him. I'll tell you what happened. He got a cell phone. Probably <laughs> even one of those ones that flips open. Who does he think he is? Some high-powered corporate attorney? I think he actually does go to law school now. Exactly! Not even a lawyer yet, and he already has the phone. Cart before the horse, don't you think? A clerk strolls up to them. She's in full goth hair and makeup, but wears a cell phone palace polo shirt. Can I help you? Yes, could you please show me your most expensive phone? The clerk hands the phone to Jason. Johnson, I told you to have those reports on my desk by this morning. You incompetent sack of pig feed, no excuses, you're fired. Jason hands the phone back. Look, I, I'm sorry, but, but this one doesn't feel quite right. Could you perhaps show me your most popular and reasonably priced phone? The clerk, annoyed, goes to get another phone. Sack of pig feed. <laughs> Exterior, strip mall parking lot a few minutes later. 
Outside the store, they both stand mesmerized as Jason flips his phone open and closed over and over again. Exterior, Seed and J liquor store, same time. On the other end of the strip mall, Shauna and Jessica exit the liquor store. Each carries a paper bag filled with booze. Jessica, 21, wears a fleece jacket and sweatpants folded twice at the waist that advertise the local college. Shauna, 21, has short hair with a dyed pink streak in it. She's dressed in a more alternative style. Exterior, highway, continuous. Shauna and Jessica walk down the shoulder of a two-lane highway carrying the booze. Wind blows their hair when the occasional car whizzes by. The foliage is in full bloom. Autumn Sweater by Yola Tengo plays on the soundtrack. We notice that Shauna is lagging behind, taking in the beauty of the season. Jessica plows ahead. Exterior, Jessica and Shauna Street continuous. They've turned down a tree-lined residential street in proximity to the college. A few houses are decorated for Halloween. So who's definitely? Robbie's coming and Kate and Mitch and Allison is Ben. He said, he said he has to study, but I'm sure he'll show up at some point. So here's a question. Let's just say, for the sake of argument, that Ben is, uh, <laughs> how do I put this? Uh, well, let's just say that Ben died. How? In a car accident. Not his fault. So I'm a grieving widow. Grieving ex-girlfriend. Totally different. But anyway, Ben dies and after an appropriate period of mourning. Oh god, I'd have to spend so much time with his family. What a fucking nightmare. Right, that's true. His sister would drive me insane. And, it, and his mom would totally cheap on a casket. But after that, okay, you decide to post a personal ad. They approach a townhouse split into a duplex and go inside. Interior, Jessica and Shauna's apartment, continuous. Why would I place a personal ad? Am I 40? Let's go with it. What does the ad say? <sighs> Single white female, 21, uh, knows her way around a sandwich. Oh, don't say sandwich. We <laughs> <Really> misconstrued. <laughs> I'm SWF, 21, college senior, makes a mean chicken parm. And now who are you looking for? I don't know. Those things are always so shallow. So, so you like candlelit dinners and long walks on the beach. What does that actually say about you? I hate to tell you, but the personal ads I see are more like, I like Frisbee golf and M420 friendly. <laughs> Same difference though. I don't care what their interests are, just that they're like nice or whatever. Which your current boyfriend. Why are we even talking about this? What if we wake up after Y2K and we're the last two people on earth. Then why would I be placing a personal ad? <laughs> Interior, Jason's car, same time. It's a nice car, unfortunately it won't start. They're still in the parking lot. Look, I knew I shouldn't have let your cousin mess with the engine. I told you, dude, working at a gas station does not a mechanic make. Besides, you know no one in my family is good at anything. So, who's gonna call for the tow? They play rock, paper, scissors. Jason loses and leaves the car. A beat passes. Jason gets back in the car. Need a quarter? No, but I realized something. Jason pulls out his cell phone. Oh, hell yes. Oh, shit. I promised Jessica she'd get first call. Seriously? We've got a situation here. You've been on, like, two dates with this girl. Okay, fine. Adam. Uh, I thought that Justin was doing this one. Yeah. Uh, so just to bring you guys up to speed, there's some scenes missing, and now this is going to be later the same night at Jessica and Shauna's Halloween party. Um, Aaron and Jason are dressed up as Mario and Luigi. Jessica and Shauna are dressed as Jack and Rose from Titanic. Um, and with Jason preoccupied by Jessica, Aaron has had a bit of trouble finding someone to talk to. So he's retreated to an empty room to read his book. Uh, this turns out to be Shauna's bedroom. Interior, Shauna's room, night. Is this how you woo all the girls? Wait on their beds until they drunkenly stumble in? 
so sorry. I can... No, it's it's okay. It just seems a bit sad in here. You know there's a party going on in the other room, right? I guess I was uh, having trouble being social or something. <laughs> like, I sometimes feel weird being at college parties. Because you graduated? Yeah. Uh, I'm basically the same emotionally immature loser I was in college. <laughs> Only now it's really sad because I'm supposed to be a grown-up. Didn't you only graduate in the spring? Or Professor Stevens comes to all our parties and he's like, ancient. <laughs> all my other friends moved to New York and have like careers. Whereas you're making a fine living collecting cans. People think it's a joke that I do that, but I actually applied for like 40 jobs over the summer. People take one look at me and run for the exit. Seems a bit harsh, dude. And what about Jason? It's different. Jason's a cool black guy. Everyone likes a cool black guy, especially if he's Jewish. Well, except for, like, racists and anti-Semites, but you know what I mean. Thought about grad school? I thought about applying for an MFA, but it's so expensive. Yeah, I don't know what I'm gonna do either. Jessica will move to Silicon Valley, and Ben has a job at the ACLU lined up, whereas... I'm going to graduate in the spring with an art history degree and 20 grand in loan debt. But fuck it, you know, it's Halloween. Shauna clinks her beer against Aaron's. Uh, Ben? Come on, Mario, let's go back into the party. Interior, Jessica and Shauna's apartment. A bit later, the dance floor is heated up. A lot of 90s-style grinding is happening. Rosa Parks by Outcast comes on. Oh my god. What? Oh, nothing. Just to the best song in, of the last 10 years came on. <laughs> You're saying this is the best Are you song. questioning my mixtape? <laughs> no, no. It's, it's a really good song. <laughs> you realize you have to dance with me now. <laughs> uh... Shauna pulls Aaron onto the dance floor. He reluctantly dances. Interior, Jessica's room, same time. Jessica and Jason are in her room alone. Jason examines a framed photo of Jessica with her arms around two smiling, dreadlocked white dudes. I think you're legally required to disclose being a fish fan on the first date. You know, I don't mind personally, but you know, it, it's the law. My brothers. <laughs> uh, but everyone from Burlington looks like that. <laughs> oh, you're from Burlington? Both my brothers went to UVM. One majored in ceramics. I think the other majored in gardening. Well, that can't be a It's real a real major. So he says, anyway. <laughs> so you're like, you're like the black sheep comp sci major with the, with the 4.0 GPA. I guess. I, my home life was kind of chaotic. And programming is so neat and orderly, you know? I, I like all the rules. Is that super lame? <laughs> no, 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 no. I think it's cool. I mean, it's like, it's like knowing the cheat codes in video games. Is it? <laughs> I don't know. So, what's my cheat code? Then? Have you figured it out? If I remember correctly, if you break the bricks at the end of the underground stage in world four, you can climb up the beanstalk to reach the bonus zone. That's the sexiest thing I've ever heard. They kiss. Interior, Jessica and Shauna's apartment, a bit later. The party is thinned out, tender by blur, now plays from the stereo. Shauna and Aaron are perched on a windowsill, sharing a joint. I guess I find the whole cell phone thing troubling on kind of, on a kind of Orwellian level. Like, sure, everyone wants to make a call sometimes, but soon the corporate powers that be will be tracking our movements and mining our text messages for marketing data. I see. You're one of those conspiracy loons who thinks there's too much fluoride in the water, Elvis is running a car dealership in Akron, or... W is actually a cyborg sent from the future to destroy human life. Well, maybe the Bush thing, but I guess I also just think that there's something to be said for being alone with your thoughts, you know? And, like, cell phones seems like 
just another way for people to avoid being alone because they're afraid. And I get scared too, obviously, and I get lonely, but I'm just not sure that's always a bad thing. Like, shouldn't we accept those feelings as part of the human experience? And- Donna suddenly turns away from Aaron. Aaron turns as well and recognizes Ben, who has finally arrived. Aaron's fear is confirmed. Shauna's boyfriend is the same Ben from his creative writing class. Sorry I'm so late. The trial date got pushed up and they gave all the interns like a million case histories to read. No worries. Aaron holds the joint out to Ben. He takes a hit. It's good shit. Weren't we in a class together? My new friend Aaron was just telling me why he thinks cell phones are evil. Evil? Hmm. Oh, oh. Well, not evil, uh, but... Kind of romantic, no? I mean, think of the practical applications. How much safer will women walking alone late at night be with, with 911 at their fingertips? Or if your car breaks down in the middle of nowhere? <laughs> Happened to us today, actually. I'm just saying, you don't want to be a Luddite. <laughs> Embrace the now or whatever, you know? Hey, didn't you write that story about the stoned cat? Okay, so for the next scene, about a month has passed. We're a little, um, we're, we're, around we're approaching thanksgiving and um jason and jessica's relationship has sort of progressed and they are visiting Je uh, jessica's hippie parents in vermont um aaron on the other hand jason and aaron's friendship has sort of gone in the other direction aaron has been spending a lot of time with the cab driver who picked him up from the halloween party who is um very into smoking crack and so they're sort of on these divergent paths. Um, so where we pick up, we're gonna see um, Jessica and Jason in Vermont. And, and one thing I wanna mention, because it, it's gonna come up a few times just for the younger people in the audience, is that um, back in the old days of, of basic cable, so when you had, um, you had the basic cable channels, right? And then you could pay extra to get premium channels like HBO. And if you didn't pay extra to get those premium channels, then what would happen is the channel would still be there, but it would just be like fuzz on your screen. But you could sort of hear what they were saying sometimes, or like sometimes if the wind was right, if the stars were aligned, you could like see it a little bit. Maybe Tony Soprano would sort of fade in for a second and then disappear. And so this is how Aaron and Jason have been watching The Sopranos every week in their apartment. Um, and that's kind of like their thing. Um, that's all. Interior, Jessica and Shauna's apartment, evening. Candles have been lit and the table is beautifully set. Uh, Shauna brings out the turkey breast. That looks great, Sean. It better be, it's been cooking for like nine hours. Ben puts his cell phone on the table and starts to eat. I thought... But what? I thought maybe since it's Thanksgiving, we could put our phones away just for tonight. Sure. Of course. Of course. Ben makes a show of putting the phone in his pocket. Uh, so yeah, uh, what I was saying about the turkey is you leave it in the slow cooker all day, and then to get the skin crisp, you stick it in the broiler at the... Ring, 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 ring. Sorry. You were saying? Uh, so uh, you put it in the broiler at the end to... Ring, 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 ring. Just take it. It's, it's fine. It just... One minute, I, I promise. Hey. Yeah, so, so I got the deposition. Hold on, hold on, let me read it to you. Exterior, Jessica's parents' house, garden, late night. Jason and Jessica stroll through the lush Vermont garden. The moon shines bright. Coming Up Roses by Elliot Smith plays on the soundtrack. I gotta say, I'm like so jealous that you got to grow up here. <laughs> You're super baked right now. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, your brothers are rad. <laughs> My parents used to have these crazy parties. 
people tripping on acid, swimming naked in the pond. That sounds dope. It could actually be pretty scary for a little kid. There was this one party when I was about 12. In the middle of all the chaos, I noticed this guy in a corner silently doing a Rubik's cube. Okay. He looked incredibly focused, sort of above the fray, you know? Sure. And then he finished it. The whole thing took about five minutes. <laughs> anyway, he had obviously noticed me watching, so he explained how it worked. And there's this formula you follow. And if you stick to the formula, the squares line up. Jason closes her hand, or Jessica closes her hand around Jason's. I just found that so appealing. Exterior, Aaron and Jason's apartment, morning. Aaron is up early cleaning the apartment when Jason comes in. Oh, hey, good to see you, man. Happy Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Wow, the place looks, um, well, it actually looks pretty good. <laughs> I cleaned. Not much else to do, you, you know? Yeah, I see that. So how is the trip? Well, her parents are, I think you'd like them. Uh, they're, they're pretty cool. Aaron flicks on the TV actually been coming in really well lately. Can we, um, can we actually turn that off for a minute? I, I wanted to, uh... What's up? Well, so, uh, Jessica and I decided that since I'm practically, you know, I'm practically over there all the time now, that it would kind of make sense if... If what? If I moved in with her. At her place, I mean. Wouldn't it be a bit cramped? That place isn't that big. Yeah, well, I think Shauna and Ben are actually going to get their own... Shauna's yeah. moving in with Ben? Yeah, I think they might... How am I supposed to pay rent now? Yeah, I don't know about that, but maybe... I could just move back in with my parents. Well, maybe you could get a new roommate. How am I going to find a new look, look, roommate? I don't know, dude. And it's not really my problem anymore. And this is what happens when you hang out with homeless people and crack smoking cab drivers. Now a pause to uh, bring in Justin. Okay, so it's winter now, uh, approaching Christmas. About another month has gone by. Jessica and Jason have moved in together. Aaron's new roommate is uh, Bob, the crack smoking cab driver, um, who they boys first met back at the beginning of the movie. And uh, I think that's all you need to know. Interior, Jessica and Jason's apartment, living room, night. Jessica and Jason watch TV. Jason clicks through and stops on the scrambled channel. Sopranos? That's the Sopranos? I mean, they're in there somewhere. I just see squiggly lines. <laughs> if you're so into the Sopranos, why don't we just buy HBO? That never occurred to me. Jessica changes the channel to the evening news. They're talking about Y2K. Did I tell you my brothers are going to this fish festival thing in Florida for New Year's? 48 hours to get there on the bus or something. <laughs> Ridiculous, right? Well, I don't know. That actually sounds like it. I mean, I like smoking weed too, but to build your whole life around it? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm just Glad you're liking the new job, especially well, because you look so cute in this outfit. <laughs> Exterior, town square, afternoon. Aaron is collecting bottles when Shauna approaches. Hey, haven't seen you around in a while. Been busy. I, I heard you got a new roommate? 
Yeah, Bob. Bob, right. He drives a cab. That's good. He used to be a murderer. But um, he's cool now. <laughs> You're so weird. What do you mean? Like, if this were a TV show, you'd be the quirky neighbor. Who's quirky neighbor? Jason's. It's Jason's show? Not in a bad way. I mean, I, I'm basically Jessica's quirky friend. I don't think of you that way. Uh, you didn't go home for break, huh? <laughs> My parents aren't exactly the holiday type. A and I could use the extra shifts with Marco and the others out of town. I just wish Toodle would let me cook the food I want. And like, it's a fucking sandwich shop. I'm not living under the delusion that I'm Emerald or whatever. But I do feel like parms, be they meatball, eggplant, chicken, or even veal, they get a bad rap. Totally. People dismiss them as like watered down Americanized Italian food, but it's only because the parms they're eating are so bland. <laughs> Tell me about it. I bought some from across the street and my friends were not pleased. If people could just taste a great parm like my Nona makes, they'd understand how magical a parm can be. So I guess that's my goal. I want to elevate the parm. <laughs> it sounds dumb, I know. I'm sorry to bore you with all this shit. You want to go somewhere cool? Exterior, street, afternoon. A light snow falls. Aaron pushes Shauna down the street in his grocery cart. Exterior, abandoned factory, dusk. Aaron and Shauna sit in the cab of a tractor overlooking an abandoned factory. Wow. I guess I knew this place was here, but I never really thought about it. I wonder when the factory closed. A week after my, um, 10th birthday. That specific. <laughs> my dad worked here. Um, I used to visit him. He worked the assembly line, which to a little kid was just like the most impressive thing you could imagine. Um, and he explained to me how everything worked and what his part was. He was so proud, you know? I thought he was like the smartest man in the world. That's sweet. Yeah, until they closed the place basically got in bed one day and never got back up. I don't fully blame him. When he did get out of bed, my mom would give him so much shit about finding a new job that he'd get right back in. I mean, he tried for a bit, but there weren't really jobs around and he was depressed. No one called it that, and it's not like he'd ever go to a shrink or anything, but that's what it was. I'm sorry. I used to come here when they'd fight. My mom would just be screaming her head off at him and I hated it so much. I'd hide out here and try to remember those happy times when I'd visit him at work. Aaron climbs down from the tractor. Shauna follows. They walk side by side toward the old factory building, taking in the sunset. My parents are the opposite. Like, not in the sense that they're happy, but they're so fucking polite to each other. And weirdly formal. It's, it's like they're neighbors who occasionally bump into each other at the post office and talk about the weather. All unhappy families are unhappy in different ways, right? My Nona taught me how to cook. She was born in Sicily and she'd make these amazing Sunday night meals. My cousins would be there, and all my uncles and aunts, and they were the only times my parents ever seemed happy. You just couldn't not be happy eating that food. That's really cool. Ben thinks it's stupid, but I have this pipe dream of opening a restaurant in town, 
I'd call it Nona's, a, a real old school Italian joint. Checkered tablecloths, you get induction burners instead of gas stoves, so you don't have to follow the state ventilation guidelines for gas. <laughs> and the garlic smell would just permeate everything. You've researched this. No, no, it's it's just a pipe dream. Um, ben and I are moving to... Moving. He has this job at the ACLU lined up, and he's been pressuring me to apply to culinary school there. Yeah, they have this really great program, and all the best restaurants in the world are in New York, and... And that's what you want? I guess I don't know what I want. Hey, new book. You, you finished Tolstoy? Oh, uh, yeah. Finished that. Any good? I've, I've heard it's a classic. It's basically about rich people who have nothing better to do than fall in love. I mean, in a good way. Like, it's very romantic. And it sort of makes you wish that now could be like that. Or at least that you were rich. Everyone's very passionate and intense and serious about love. It's kind of refreshing. I feel like everyone I know these days only cares about careers. Look at my parents. Were they ever in love? I kind of doubt it. They sort of just fell into it and then they had me and I think that kept them together even when they started to hate each other. They're so miserable. And sometimes it just makes me think that love is really like all that's important. So I should be more focused on my future or whatever, but I feel like, hey, you can get a job anytime. I mean, you're gonna end up with one sooner or later and then chances are you'll get fired and end up in bed like my dad. So why rush it? We're in our twenties now the time when you find that person these years right now maybe even today that's what i'm doing while everyone's out there getting their cell phones and stocking up on canned fish for y2k i'm in the streets with my eyes open looking for love and cans and bottles love shauna's basically floored by this they're staring intently at each other perhaps about to kiss when Shauna's phone buzzes. Ben, they both see. Shauna tries to quickly put the phone away, but the moment is lost. Aaron suddenly gets self-conscious and steps away from Shauna. You up? Yeah, back at the square. We could give you a ride. Thanks, but I've got the cart. End of reading, thank you. Now, let me transition back to uh, my friend and colleague, Tasha Oren of uh, Film Media Studies, uh, who will be leading a question and answer session with uh, members of the company. Tasha, take it away. Thank you, Noe. Thank you, everybody. This was really terrific. Um, and I, I, I'm going to start with a few basic questions, and then we'll go ahead and move to the chat. So please put your questions in the chat. And I'm going to start with Adam and Justin, um, but everybody else involved in the production, feel free to, to jump in. So Adam and Justin, tell us about the beginning of this project. You're both writers, you're published authors, and you're now collaborating on this script. Can you tell us a little bit about how it started and what the process is like uh, working together on one on one project? Sure. I mean, it's it's been a, quite a long journey, really. Um, we started writing this, I think, eight years ago now. Um, we were both, we had decided to go up to the Berkshires for a couple weeks to work on our respective book projects that we were each working on. And we were in a house where one of us was on one floor writing all day and the other was on the other floor writing all day. And we were just sort of silent and separate and could hear each other pacing around, but mostly kept to, you know, we'd meet for lunch and then break again. Um, and then kind of just for fun in the evenings, we thought we would try to write a screenplay, which was something I, I had done a little bit before, but not really in a serious way. And, and um, so we would make a fire and we would pour a couple drinks and we just really started um, spitting back and forth and just 
just kind of riffing on conversations we'd been having and, and sort of funny conversations we'd been having. Um, I think the original, the, the real origin, the first scene we wrote was we were, it was winter and it was very dry up there. And we had gone to super stop and shop um, to try and buy moisturizer. And we were both sort of these two guys without their girlfriends who were, didn't know what kind of moisturizer to buy or, or we were just overwhelmed by the, the selection of moisturizers in the super stop and shop. And, and we started writing some dialogue just like about this, just sort of this funny jokes about buying moisturizer. And, and then we started thinking about the characters and, and it sort of went from there really. Yeah. Um, I don't have a whole lot to add to that uh, other than to confirm that the moisturizer conversation in the stop and shop was absolutely the first scene written, uh, written from life. Um, probably the most autobiographical thing in the whole uh, script. Um, and that I think because uh, we were working so intently at that time on these other projects, um, trying to get, you know, our respective second novels off the ground, um, which Adam, to his credit, eventually did. Sensation Machines came out a couple of years ago. And it's a wonderful novel. Um, I eventually abandoned mine and, and wrote the memoir that Albert mentioned instead. Um, but we were spending so much time during the day working on the quote unquote serious thing or the thing we had budgeted the time for that there was just such a huge sense of freedom um, around the screenplay. I mean, starting from the decision to even do it or not, and then having decided to do it, you know, what it might be, what, where it could grow, um, just really felt like anything went. And uh, so we wrote a lot of the first draft really in those two weeks. Um, and then, you know, the last seven years have just been picking, refining, revising, seeing what other people think, you know, moving it more toward something with an actual shape, um, which I hope that it that it now has. Um, you know, hopefully it has the spirit of some of that looseness, but not um, too much. So yeah. That's great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna turn to Max now. And also if I could um, bring in Albert and Ron. So for the three of you, can you talk a little bit about what attracted you to the script? Um, how did you start working on it? And what's the process has been like bringing it into uh, to production? I'll go. Um, I, the script, I, I, I met Adam, um, sort of like just on a general meeting. I was a fan of his novel and, and we had a mutual friend in common and he sent me this the script he'd written with Justin. And um, I was immediately taken by the how present their voice was in, in the writing. It, it had such, it felt like there was no one else in the world that could, could write this experience besides them. And it had such a sense of place and so much pathos and so much humor and so much heart. Um, it was right around the part in the script where they, where, where um, Aaron and Shauna are at the factory and he's talking about his dad and she's talking about his Nona that I had chills. And I thought, I, I don't just kind of want to produce this. I actually really want to direct this. I just, the way it made me feel was something that you, you hope when you read a script and so rarely find. Um, and I, you know, I, when I was, you know, the age of, of the actors in, in the reading who I just want to say you all did a terrific job. I couldn't have been more uh, impressed by all of you. Um, and Noe is the goth girl. I, I like that reading as well. Um, I, um, I would go and see movies produced by Albert and Ron and think, you know, I really want to make movies like this someday. Like these are, whether it was election, little miss sunshine, um, I want, I want to make these kinds of movies. And I had been working with Albert and Ron on another project, um, that I, and I had such a great time working on a script with them that I had written. And, um, they were my dream people for this. And I sent it to, I sent it to them with the caveat of saying, I've just read this. These writers have never written a script before, but it has, it has the thing in it that is what makes me want to get out of bed and make movies. And, um, and having no idea what they would, um, what they're, what they would, how they would respond. Um, and um, I'll let Albert and Ron describe what happened next. That, that's pretty much, uh, uh, 
you know, the way it was, we read the script when Max sent it to us. Uh, a writer we work with, a novelist a lot, uh, Tom Parada, also is a friend of Adam's. And, uh, uh, you know, over the years has talked about Adam's work. And uh, Tom told us about the script as well. And uh, when we read the script, we just thought that Max was particularly well suited towards directing it. And um, it really had a nice flavor. And Max had, uh, I think, worked with uh, Adam and Justin on a couple of drafts. And then we added our notes as well a bit. And, um, you know, we're just moving forward in the process. We're at the point now where um, Justine and Kim are be becoming a big factor in, you know, who will we go to to play the various parts? Uh, we also are at the point where we need to find financing. And an event like this is uh, tremendously helpful to all of us. And I echo what Max said, the actors were great. And thank you, Noe, for, for, for shaping that and putting that together. But it really helps us understand what is working with the, the screenplay and what perhaps still needs work. And, uh, and so, you know, we're feeling our way forward. And, um, you know, I, I think we're, we're getting somewhere. And as I said, we really hope to make it in the, uh, the beautiful Northeastern fall uh, at a, you know, maybe a town in, in, uh, in Western Massachusetts or somewhere like that. And, uh, you know, we'll see who we come up with. Uh, Ron, do you have other thoughts? Yeah, it was uh, really great to, to see and, and hear it read. I mean, the screenplay has, um, so many ideas that are attractive to us as producers. Um, and I was just kind of floating through it as far as uh, class and privilege and self-definition and, you know, how you find a place in America and what's um, a good thing to do or an admirable uh, way to live. And, um, you know, just to think in 1999, like being an entrepreneur and wanting to have a sandwich shop or a restaurant meant a lot different than it does today. Um, uh, and, and same thing with going into business. It's just, we're, it, it's, it's really a fascinating subject, the kind of kaleidoscope of what your options are and why you choose to do what you do if you're lucky enough to have that freedom, which in a way all these characters do have that freedom after college, but it's still, a kind of scary, anxious freedom. So, you know, some of the films we've, you know, been attracted to, made by other people in our own films, really explore that. How do you make a sense or make some sense out of your existence when you have a choice in front of you? Yeah, I mean, we haven't, uh, uh, you haven't heard the whole screenplay to the audience out there, but for us, it reminded us of, uh, you know, movies from 20 years ago, say early Richard Linkletter's early work or uh, Cameron Crowe, uh, his movies come to mind as well. And I think, Max, you had mentioned uh, uh, people like Kenny Lonergan's plays, and uh, maybe you can count on me as well as uh, other references that this sort of echoes. Yeah, the last picture show was what it, it reminded me of immediately, which is one, one of my favorite movies, a Peter Bogdanovich movie. And it had this, there's just this sense of foreboding throughout, despite the, despite the, the lightheartedness of the kids and the laughter, they're, they're, you know, they're hiding something, which is just a change that things are forever going to be different. And, you know, when I read this, it was at the height of COVID and I found, um, I found all of the preparations for Y2K were eerily similar to what we thought was going to help us um, survive the COVID outbreak. And um, when we talked about it, Justin and Adam and I and, and Ron and Albert, we got them to enhance it a little more to really make the time similar. And um, yeah, it's just like, it's it, the, the one thing you look for when you read someone's writing is just the voice. And, and I, I just think in their, in their books and in the screenplay, Adam and, and Justin have such a clear voice and sense of, um, personality that it just I find it so inspiring and it made it it really came to life actually we'd never heard it read aloud um and to hear to hear the actors of Tufts get to read it aloud in in the place that I think we were all kind of imagining this all take this takes place in whether it's in Medford or somewhere close by or just 
it, it gave me a really warm feeling inside. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. And Justine, I have a question for you, as I understand that you are beginning the process of casting right now. So can you talk a little bit about how, what do you look for in an actor to embody a role? What do we not know about casting? That That's such a difficult question. Um, you know, it's sort of, um, you know, you read a script and you have some ideas floating through your mind as to who could be lovely in those parts. And then it's all a big discussion with your director and producers and, you know, and honesty is a big thing that we look for, you know, when you're, when you're looking for somebody to portray um, a person, it's like, um, who's going to bring the the real the real person to this part it's such a difficult thing because it's so instinctual you know when you're um, um when you're looking at actors meeting with actors reading with actors sometimes a person that you would never have imagined would be able to fit into the shoes of this character fits so beautifully and so it's sort of a question that i can't answer in a way because you're just looking for you have a general idea. It's a casting such a weird job and it's so difficult to talk about. Um, but it's, you have a general idea of who you think might be wonderful. And oftentimes that can pan out for you. And then sometimes you just find this person that jumps in and is completely magic for the part that you never would have thought of. You know, it's an incredible, um, it's an incredible, my job is one of the most incredible jobs because you get to see gold dust in people. You get to see them come and bring um, just magic to a part. They, they make a person real. And so it's hard for me to answer that question of what I'm looking for. I only know once I see it, or, you know, I, or I only know once I see it, once I feel it. It's um, really a deep stomach instinct um, thing when you're casting. You know, you just try and meet as many people as you can and um, read as many people as you can. And you learn from every single reading, um, you, you learn something about the character that um, you can bring into the next reading. Or you hear the director talking to the actor and you can bring what the director has said into the next reading. And, you know, you sort of like hone in on this perfect person. I, I hope that answers somehow. You know, all, also um, there's an interesting thing uh, in casting where at times you're looking for uh, the right person for the part and other times you need somebody who is known in some way uh, in order to help um, you know raise the money for the movie and so it's a there's a tricky balance there's a artistic element certainly but then there's also a business side to it too maybe Max uh, could talk a little bit about that yes it's it is <laughs> it is a tricky balance and um you there's there's you know there it is a tricky balance it's um you want to cast the right people for for the right part because you know for these for these four you know main characters you 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 feel like if the audience will really quickly sniff out you know what Justine is saying someone that feels like they're they're playing the part instead of just kind of being and um you know what i love about this script and, and is there's creative ways you know there's a there's a professor stevens who's mentioned but not seen in the pages you read to cast there's a, some parents roles and there's there's some smart things to do to surround because i think I, the idea of discovering people as you saw how exciting it was to just see the four of you guys Five of you guys reading it today was was very exciting there's also you know it's also my job if i want to cast it that way to be as responsible from a production standpoint as possible which means as as few days as possible on the shoot day because each shoot day costs a lot of money um having having a, a responsible amount of um crew and um how you shoot it and and how much you can jam into a day and that's stuff that i've i've experimented in in 
all of the stuff I've done. And I've always, you know, put for the most part up until this stage value in, in having the creative be as close to, um, my vision and, and the filmmakers, you know, producers and myself vision as possible while trying to be responsible with, with how much we spend to be able to cast the people that we want the most. Yes. And to add on to what Albert was saying is if you do need a name per se, um, you know, you make a list and you bring it to producers and director and you talk about each person and, you know, that how the jigsaw puzzle of the more bigger name that will help finance the film um, would work with then the discovery. You know what I mean? You just sort of make that jigsaw puzzle. Um, and it's very lovely to work with Albert and Ron and now with Max because it's, um, it's you're talking to people that really love actors. You know, they're not just looking to fill check boxes. They really love actors. And it is such a joy to talk to people like that. And, and, and it is a jigsaw puzzle really because um, you're dealing with, you know, all of these characters are a certain age. And, you know, normally you start with perhaps the most um, well-known actor that is going to help you build the rest of the thing around, but that it's not just that they've got to be good for the part and be known in order to help the budget, but it's then how will that affect the other casting? And so you're really, it, it is a puzzle that you're putting together. Mm. Mm. Oh, Ron, were you going to add something? Well, I don't think so, but I'm <laughs> I, uh, I'm happy to add something, but I have no idea what it would be. Um, <laughs> maybe I made a sudden movement with my hand that was misread. Uh, we can go ahead and, and start the a couple of questions in the chat. Um, so first question is, um, this is from JJ. I, uh, I'm curious how Adam and Justin developed the main character's post-grad struggle and rooting it in reality. I'm not gonna um, say it's autobiographical, but I won't say it's not autobiographical. Yeah. I mean, their names start with the same letters as our names. Um, I think we thought back uh, to that time. I, I think in the earliest draft, I, I don't, I think one of the first decisions we made, and Adam will correct me if I'm wrong, was probably to connect them to a university in some way, because um, it just kind of gave them a place to be. And I think at some point we figured out that maybe they had just finished but that Jessica and Shauna had not quite finished. Um, and so that was, the university is just, you know, kind of a way to put everybody in the same place, but kind of stagger what they're all doing. Um, and I think it gave us some reasons for Aaron to talk to the Professor Stevens character. You know, Aaron was kind of, maybe not Stevens' best student, but certainly one he had a lot of affection for and a kid that he's kind of rooting for. And, and so, you know, Aaron is someone who doesn't have a lot of support in his life, as I think came across even in these excerpts. Um, but Stevens is an old prof that he can run into or hit up who will, you know, kind of be there for him and, and give him a little bit of grounding in a certain way. And we we have a, another question here that's a, that begins with eight years ago. <laughs> that's dedication. What does it take for an idea to convince or inspire you to commit to developing it? Well, you know, I don't want to make it sound like we just spent the last eight years <laughs> working on the script. I mean, I think we, you know, we wrote it eight years ago, and then there have been pockets and moments where more work has been done on it. But a lot of that time, it was really just spent sitting around and, um, you know, until someone was interested in it and excited in it, who was Max and that, you know, sort of encouraged us to, to dig back in. And, and I think really a lot of, you know, what's taken it from being just sort of like a funny, you know, I think it was a script that had some nice moments. It was funny and, and, and feel like something that's really been developed has been done in the, in the last year, um, working with Max and then working with, um, Albert and Ron. So, you know, I guess, um, I guess there's the initial, there's the initial just sort of like love 
fest of like, this is a fun thing we're doing. Let's hammer this out. Let's enjoy ourselves. And it was loose and it was fun. And we were laughing and we were really just writing it, you know, for our own entertainment. And then, and then this sort of like, okay, maybe this is really a thing. Let's see if we can, you know, make it a real thing. Let's, let's try that. Let's do our best. So I guess you have to have both of those, both of those uh, sides. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And I won't add a ton onto that other than to just take an opportunity to, to thank Max um, for being so excited about this and for really seeing um, not only what, you know, I, we hope was already there, but, but really what it could be and, and pushing us for that last year. Um, just talking to us about it and giving tons of feedback and um, giving us movies to watch and, and getting us, you know, into the conversation with with Albert and Ron and, and really to them too. Um, so yeah, not, not eight years of, of consistent effort, um, but it's, you know, it was good to always have it to come back to and, and those occasional boosts when somebody connected with it and wanted to get it to the next place um, were a real lift, you know? So here's a follow-up from uh... Julian in the audience, how has your perspective regarding the characters, story, et cetera, changed over the past eight years? By the way, I think Julian was a uh, former uh, 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 intern over the summer if, and uh, had covered this, uh, this script. I, I believe if it's the same Julian. I mean, I guess I'll just say <laughs> when we wrote it, they were about 10 years younger than us. Um, now they're about 20 years <laughs> younger than us. So uh, I think there's maybe been a little bit of a change <laughs> there, um, but, I'm, but I'm almost uh, frightened to say what it might be. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, although I, I you know, I, I think I, um, I just turned 40, but I still sort of see myself as 20 in my, not, not in the screen, because I can see that I'm bald, but you know, in my, in my, in here. Uh, so maybe it hasn't changed that much. I, I still, I think, have a lot of tenderness and, a, and affection toward these characters and probably will continue to. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm with Adam on that. I mean, I think especially as, well, I say we, but as, at least as I get older, you know, the, and get further away from the characters of that age, I feel much more tenderness toward them um, because they seem so, they seem so much younger than me now. <laughs> Um, you know, I mean, I, I also would like to feel 20 inside, but I, you know, seeing myself on the Zoom, um, I know that's not the case. Uh, and so I think maybe it helped bring some of the heart out, um, in the movie, maybe the, the earlier drafts, um, you know, not just because we were younger, but I mean, it was a different time. Uh, this was pre-COVID, this was pre-Trump, it was pre a lot of stuff, you know, <laughs> Um, and I think maybe as the world's gotten nastier, we've been inclined to get um, a little more generous. And maybe that's where some of the warmth uh, that people ended up reacting to in the script kind of emerged out of. Yeah, I think it is really warm. And uh, to me, why I related to it now is because I, I never related to movies about people this age having the time of their life. Like, I, I, I never like just partying and enjoying themselves. I always had sort of like a, a melancholy about aging. I remember like crying at my fifth birthday because I realized like I was getting older. And so like, I I still relate to these characters. And when I did when I first read it because they are thinking about a lot of the things I'm still thinking about, which is change and life and death and our family and what it's going to look like when we're older. And to me, I feel as if, I don't know. I, I feel a softness to these characters um, because I, I kind of want to pat them on the back when I when I read, you know, Justin and Adam's writing and just say it gets it gets a little easier, you know, and, and just go go easy and it'll all work out. Just maybe not on your exact timeline um, of needing the information when you get it. But I still very much think about a lot of this stuff even now and so I to me it doesn't just like when I, I see a, a play of this is our youth or I or I read Kenneth Lonergan's you know masterpiece play which this first reminded me of I 
I still feel so much of that in my, that restlessness in my spirit, despite not being that age that I, I am, um, I always will relate to it still. I also think, you know, the distance from the, the actual time period has made it sort of interesting too, because like when we first wrote it, I don't think we we ha didn't we couldn't get anyone particularly interested in it, and I think part of that was that it was too soon for people to be reflecting on the late '90s or have nostalgia for that moment. And now we're sort of far far enough away that I think you know it's it's it, it's in a, we can see it in a different light and and look at you know we're far enough away to sort of think about like cell phones like i think 10 years ago when we wrote it the cell phone scene might not have been funny because it, it wouldn't have seemed so absurd but now you know we can sort of look back on that moment and people are like dressing like they're in the 90s again which i i quite like um you know but um but i think that that's 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 another factor in terms of you know why the movie suddenly seems like like, I feel like there were all these movies set in the 80s and everyone was like having their 80s moment. And then there was like the early 90s. And this is like very much 99, 99, 2000 is like a different moment than even like the mid 90s movies or, or the early 90s. It's like really this moment of change that I think can be seen more clearly now. And it's also right before, I mean, it's right before Y2K, but it's also before 9-11. Um, which is this thing that I think for people of our generation or of our age really felt like it was like the big event of our of our sort of life at that point and and did feel like it changed everything and and I think this moment right before then does seem sort of innocent in in a way or or um you know which I think matches sort of where the characters are at one great thing about uh the script is uh both of your musical references um that was a, a wonderful aspect the music of that time and you know you hear it uh uh no way in description brought up a few of the places that you put the music but i i think that's going to be a big element of the movie too um when, when we were writing it, we were we were also watching. We were in the Berkshires, and we didn't we actually didn't have cable or internet. I think, and we had a DVD player, and we were actually this was probably the last time I've ever done this, but literally going and renting DVDs and coming, or we were actually buying DVDs from like a bin at the Super Stop and Shop, which is where I got literally everything that we needed. And so we were watching all these movies from the '90s that all had these great sound, like we were watching, you know, these sort of like fun teen movies like Empire Records or I don't know, Reality Bites and um, Dazed and Confused. And they all had these great soundtracks. And that was definitely a part of it for us of just thinking about like, oh, you know, this was so fun. And that was such a fun time where, where soundtracks were a thing. I feel like, I don't know, maybe they still are, but I don't. Yeah, I don't Mallrats, know. I think we bought Mallrats for a dollar. I mean, the Mallrats, Mallrats was soundtrack probably was a huge movie. part of. We watched it's that movie cool a number of me. times. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Maybe more than we should admit. Yeah, the soundtrack's I, great. Yeah. The movie's great. Whether, yeah, it's great. It was, I stand by more rats. That, that much better than Clerks, I think, actually. It was, I agree. It was unfairly. And the um, soundtrack is like... What is it? It's like all these pop punk covers. And a Weezer song that was never released. Yep. Zan. Yeah. Amazing song. Well, let's move on. We've got another question um, about writing. Is it easier? This is from Jim. Is it easier to? I have no idea because I've never done it any other way. Um, Adam, other way. Um, Adam has a little more. Experience, but um, yeah, I, I did this because he wanted to. Um, and, uh, I couldn't be happier with how it worked out, but I have absolutely nothing with which to compare it. I don't know if I don't know if it's easier, you know, that fun bleeds into the script in a way that, that is productive. Yeah, I, w I was a screenwriter for the first nine years of my career. And, uh, I think you just said it, Adam, it's a lot more fun. You just said it, Adam, it's a lot more fun doing it producing i mean ron and i have been partners for 30 years and i uh, it, it you know it's good to you know share the joy with and also the 
you know, share the joy with and also the misery. Anyway, good yeah, to no, collaborate. And that's I, the thing about film is it's a collaboration. You're working with a lot of different people and uh, the, you know, it starts with you two, but it builds from there. Yeah. And these very long books that, I mean, mine took me like nine years to write. And that, that unlike this was something I was laboring on for hours every single day laboring on for hours alone in a room writing a book um, with yourself and your thoughts, which, which is something that I, I love too. But I think, you know, this was such a, this, you know, this was such a pace from being a, a novelist or an essay writer or whatever to, to actually get to not be in a room with other people, but at least be on a Zoom with other people every once in a while. You know, these hopefully, every once in a while you know these, um but that's been a really nice thing the collaborative aspect yeah i will say for me having never done this before it was it was really opened up um it was really opened up um, this adam and i lived in the same place we lived a few blocks from each other and in brooklyn um you know he's still there on the other side of the country now but it was drafted in the same room the first few years whenever we did work on it was really Years whenever we did work on it was really together. It was a lot of just cracking each other up, a little bit of reining each other in, um, you know, writing with but also for each other. Um, and it was that was a real pleasure, um, you know, in a way that that solo writing, even with, uh, alone in a room. You know, I, I think in some ways it's the difference between television and film. Uh, you know, in, in, in film, by and large, you know, you'd either have one writer or two, uh, but in television, you have a whole room of writers and, and uh, it's a very different experience. Um, you know, it, it's sort of the showrunner is the one that it all goes through, but, but there can be, you know, several writers working on any given script in television. I'm just thinking about um, CJ's and the internship that you got and, and learning about him and the internship you guys created. And like, these guys were getting thoughts and feedback from coverage that people from this internship were working on during the process. And I don't know, I just, it feels like there's like a real tough DNA in, in this script um, because of Adam's connection to Albert and the sense of place and just autumn in New England and what the leaves look like. And I don't know, I just, it, it feels like some, we got really good feedback um, from everybody who works at Bonafide, whether it's, you know, Albert and Ron or Claire and, but also the interns that, that were from Tufts. And I, I just, um, I don't know, for writing, I, I think kind of, it's so hard that you kind of want to take a great idea from anywhere um when it comes and um we've gotten really good um feedback from from you guys who i'm sure some of you guys are on the zoom and and um i'm really grateful for that thank you max that that's a beautiful way for us to to wrap up our, our question and answer period um and thank you everybody we are now so emotionally involved in this production <laughs> we we want to see it yeah um, well let's film at tufts Yes, <laughs> absolutely. I, um, I wanted to uh, now uh, just turn things over to Sarah Dellinger, who is the Associate Director of Development. Uh, and she did so much work to bring us all together for this event tonight. Um, so, Sarah. Thank you, Tasha. And thank you to all of our participants tonight. We had fun and we hope that you did too. If you'd like to make a gift in support of the CJ Saraceno Internship Fund, uh, please click the link in our chat. It'll also be available in our post-event communications. And a jumbo thanks to the Office of Alumni Engagement for sponsoring this event. Thank you and good night. Thank you and good night.